Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the director of the Georgia Center for the Book. And welcome back to Character Hall here at First Baptist Church for another continuing series of author talks as part of Conversations at First Baptist. We have been here for, I think, Deborah, correct me, 15 years? I think that's right. Yes, yes, yes. English major, not a math major, so if it's close, it works. Uh, we've been doing these for 15 years over here, and we're just so happy to have this relationship to be able to talk about books and literature um, in what I think is a wonderful, welcoming environment. As you've seen on the crawl as you came in, we will be over here several times this fall for some very exciting author events with Jessamyn Ward and Tracy K. Smith, and of course, Roxanne Gay will be back in town um, this fall. So do find our website and register for those programs. We know some of them will be very close to capacity and sell out, so do be sure to secure a seat for those. I am just so pleased, of course, to have the opportunity to welcome you all and, of course, welcome a Georgia author and welcome, of course, one of the members of your church who leads your church and does such wonderful introductions for us and has always been such a caring and welcoming person. So would you please welcome to the microphone now Shelley Woodruff. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of First Baptist, I want to take a moment to welcome you to this space. I am one of the pastors at First Baptist Church, and it's a privilege to be able to be on this staff and to be part of this community. And I just want to first welcome you to a conversations event. We yes. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you, though. Um, we really love doing these events, and we have a, a wonderful October planned ahead of you, so pay attention to the calendar of events that are coming. These events are always free to the public, and they are partners with Georgia Center for the Book, and we also get to partner with our local booksellers, which are such a backbone in our Decatur community, and Acapella Books today are our bookseller today who are bringing this book that is coming out. You get it early. It actually comes out tomorrow, but you get it today. Um, thanks to the work of Acapella Books, and thank you for supporting them. But we get to host these events with authors here um, because we value being a church that brings the community into this space to have conversations that matter, conversations that are challenging, conversations that um, put us in conversation and dialogue with one another. And as we exit this space, we hope and pray that this community will be changed, will be uncomfortable, will be challenged and convicted, but we'll walk away as better humans and part of this, this community. And so that is why we as a church are committed to hosting these things. And so I want to thank you on behalf of the church for being here and taking time to have these kinds of conversations amongst yourselves and even in your own um, hearts and minds. But I also want to welcome you to this particular event. This one is special to us. Usually, when we bring an author in for one of these things, they are a novelist or an advocate or um, an intellectual who is not part of our community. They come from afar and we might be familiar with their, their body of work a little bit or maybe we're not and we're here to just learn something new, but our connection with that thinker is abstract. Today is different and it is a privilege because we are inviting not only an intellectual and an advocate, but we are inviting someone who is very much a part of the Atlanta community and the Decatur community and who has invested so much in this First Baptist community over the course of his career. And to be able to ha host him as he launches this brand new book is special for us. You know, many of us know Dr. Gushy in very different ways. I first encountered Dr. Gushy almost two decades ago in an ethic classroom at Oxford University the professor was referencing this relatively new book called Kingdom Ethics by a theologian. I had no idea who he was. And then fast forward a couple years later, I'm having lunch at my alma mater seminary, and here comes that professor who had been um, newly hired by that seminary. And then a couple years later, I walk into a Sunday school classroom that I become a part of and get entrenched with, and he's my Sunday school teacher. And then fast forward a couple years later, he becomes our interim pastor and leads us through a very pivotal transition period. So many of us in this room know our author today in these more personal terms. 
as a Sunday school teacher, as a pastor, as a friend, as someone who has taught us how to be a community of faith, how to pray, how to study the Bible from a personal perspective. But we also know Dr. Gushy as someone who has given for two decades now moderate to progressive Christians a voice to help us articulate the way we are experiencing our faith in this very divided and controversial and changing time. Dr. Gushy's work has allowed progressive to moderate Christians and those around us to give a critical eye, a critical lens to the faith that we have often inherited and be able to examine it a little bit more closely and appropriate it for ourselves in ways that are really meaningful and to choose a path forward that is more ethical, that is more inclusive, and that is more liberating. So we have a brand new book that is coming out by Dr. Gushy. He's going to be speaking about this to now um, after a long body of, of work on all kinds of topics from, um, from prayer, that a fabulous book that he wrote with his intuitive and compassionate wife, Janine, um, to books on religion and sexuality, to even the, the Holocaust and torture, and now tackling a, a topic that's been near to his heart for a while of our current political climate and how we make sense of that as people of faith. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Gushy to our, um, actually our pulpit, which is quite appropriate, um, wearing all of these hats. Thank you so much for being a part of us this evening. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Shelly, that was a spectacularly kind introduction, and I'm very grateful. Um, did you say Oxford University? Is that what you said? That's a nice way to start an introduction. I kind of like that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of my wife, Jeannie, and my mother-in-law, Lenny, who uh, also have been members of this church, and I'm really glad that they could join us uh, this evening. So thank you for being here, y'all. They're members of my former Sunday school class here, um, and uh, people uh, from this church, uh, people I've loved for a long time. So it, it's a lot of uh, emotions tonight. I'm trying to, to talk about democracy, and, um, and I'll try to stay on the topic, but meanwhile, I'm sure there'll be a lot of reminiscing later. Um, if you already have a copy of the book, could you wave it? Do I see? There we go. Look at that. It lives. It's real. It exists in the world. You know, when, when you're an author, um, you know, I mean, I, I first submitted, I think I submitted the manuscript of this book Labor Day of last year. And, and then I had one last shot at the manuscript around uh, Christmas time. And now it has been, well, you might say the 10 months of gestation. And now it is being born into the world right now. So um, I'm excited about it. So I wrote uh, some comments. I think I'll be speaking for about uh, 25 minutes maybe. And I had a long PowerPoint, but the level of detail I concluded it was too much. Um, and uh, so I thought I, I would give you a somewhat less detailed talk, and then I'm happy to answer questions as well. So um, the book is called Defending Democracy from Its Christian Enemies. People say, wow, nice, polite title, Gushy. Uh, what's that? Um, real peaceable kind of way to start a book. Um, but this is the title that has been in my mind um, for, for this book from the beginning. It, it began as an inaugural address. I have an appointment at the Free University of Amsterdam. And I could say it in Dutch, but I would butcher it, and that would be embarrassing for everyone who knows the Dutch language. So. Let's just say in May of 2022, I was inaugurated as to a chair in that university, and I gave a, a short version of this talk to that European academic audience about, it was basically not only what is going wrong in American democracy, but are there international patterns, and I believe that there are. And it was well received, and I decided to go ahead and make it a book, and that is where, where we began. Um, so I'm happy to report that Prior to the release date of the book, uh, my publisher, Erdman's, tells me that it has already exceeded its first year sales projections. So the book has already sold more than they expected it would sell in a year, and it's the number one bestseller for Erdman's before it even sees the light of day. So people are interested. 
Uh, people are interested because, because we know that, that we're in a crisis, and we don't know exactly how to describe it or what to do about it. So let's get after it, shall we? Um, by the way, if you look at the cover, does anybody know what that cover is depicting? What is the, that's January 6th is the e evocation. What is the design? That's the Christian flag, which flew on January 6th. Yeah, along with some other flags. The thesis of this book is that many Christians in the United States and elsewhere today are demonstrating an attraction to a dangerous authoritarian and reactionary politics. Those are the two key words, authoritarian and reactionary. That a politics that poses a grave threat to free and open democracy. My book is a warning about what political scientists call democratic backsliding. That's a good religious term, democratic backsliding. Or democratic deconsolidation, when a country that had a previously well-established practice of democracy, it begins to come apart. Especially where that democratic backsliding is aided and abetted by Christians who are in the process of abandoning pro-democratic Christian traditions that are centuries old. So this is a book about Christians who are in various countries, including our own, knowingly or unknowingly contributing to democratic backsliding. The writing of this book was motivated by the shocking events in our country that culminated in the January 6th insurrection. But these events um, had been brewing for some time. We dare not see January 6th in a vacuum. The events do involve the anti-democratic tactics to which our former president resorted when he could not hold on to power uh, through democratic means. But deeper examination, especially examination of the strong support of many reactionary Christians, I'll define that word in a minute, for everything that he did, including insurrection, Christian support for those actions that threaten democracy reveals deeper, longer-term dynamics that must be explored. Undertaking that exploration led to growing awareness on my part that these dynamics are not confined to the United States. So where to begin? Our, our current democratic crisis reveals a need to revisit the very meaning of democracy, that word democracy. I suggest that we took it for granted for a long time. Most people would struggle to give you a definition of it. I realized that the rather mediocre 12th grade government class that I had didn't do much to help. Um, a few classes in college helped, but in general I think um, we don't know much about the democracy within which we live. So digging around, I, I, I follow standard contemporary political scientists in the US and suggesting that a democracy, a modern democracy, is characterized by the rule of the people under the rule of law. That's a democracy. That is, a democracy exists where the people and or their representatives create the constitution under which they will live, they agree to live. They write the panoply of laws which govern various aspects of their behavior. They enshrine civil rights and civil liberties in order to protect individual and minority rights. And they elect their own leaders through free, fair, contested elections that are decided by popular vote. That's a democracy. A wide range of norms, practices, and rules, not just laws, protect democracy. As in other fields of human endeavor, so also in democracy, one can identify best practices within a tradition that has developed over time. Pro-democracy groups like Freedom House, I urge you to check out the Freedom House website, offer numerous helpful guides as to the best practices in contemporary democracy. Countries that claim to be democratic, and Freedom House does this, can be characterized as moving toward better democracy or deeper adherence to democratic norms, holding steady or drifting away from best practices. 
Concerned citizens in any democracy should care about the direction of movement in their own country. In other words, a democracy is a living organism that is either becoming healthier and more democratic or maybe holding steady or maybe having its democratic culture and practices eroded. Uh, it's clear from Freedom House as well as from our own eyes that our uh, democratic health has been declining for a while. The modern Western democratic tradition is generally agreed by scholars to have both religious and enlightenment roots. The religious roots came first. One way to trace them is to think back to the late medieval world and the first stirrings of a challenge to the old regimes that combined church and state in one grand kind of government uh, in which religion and politics were fused. The Christian monarchies of England and France and so on. Beginning in the 16th century, intensifying in the 17th and 18th centuries, proto-democratic stirrings began to be seen in um, dissenting movements, often dissenting religious movements under these established Christian governments, notably beginning in England with the Puritans and then uh, eventually the Baptists, our forebears and if you're Baptist in this room. And the Baptists are an important part of the story I'm gonna tell today. These movements, as early as uh, late 16th, early 17th century, making the, the, um, the Scottish and English kings very nervous, these movements began saying, you know who really is Lord is Christ. And we need the freedom to practice our religion uh, as, we, as our conscience demands. And there needs to be freedom from arbitrary arrest and especially religious persecution for people who have the wrong belief. There need to be limits on state power, civil rights for individuals and minority groups, special attention to freedom of conscience and religious liberty. These 17th century statements were the beginnings, you might say, of a kind of modern democratic movement in the West. I argue in the book that Puritan covenantal thought and Baptist congregational and democratic commitments were important in the birth of modern democracy and they need to be retrieved by those of us maybe who have forgotten about them today. The enlightenment roots of democracy are, are generally attributed to people like uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Both of these men offered theories of government that moved away from top-down, theologically centered, divine right of kings approaches toward, toward this vision. Government flows from the decision of the people to agree together to create limited states that have powers that are focused on securing the individual's right to life, liberty, and property. And that got written into our founding documents, uh, Jefferson, life, liberty, and remember that? The pursuit of happiness, right? Uh, or, or earlier it was life, liberty, and property, which is somewhat less inspiring, but there it was. Um, the, this is called the liberal or libertarian um, uh, birth of modern democracy, the idea being we don't get government from kings who are installed by God. We create government together as we make agreements to delegate some of our freedom to a centralized authority who terrorizes us into submission uh, so that we don't kill each other. We have a state that keeps us under control, but meanwhile, that's pretty much all that the state does and leaves us alone to pursue our lives. That vision is still with us. There are people who that's kind of mainly what they want government to do. Give them a decent police force, a decent military, and otherwise leave me alone, right? It is hard to overstate what a grand achievement it was in the early modern period for the people to wrestle control of government away from monarchs and emperors, from dictators and oligarchs, and place it in the hands of themselves under the rule of law. There was a little bit of a prehistory. There was a fascinating experiment with direct democracy in classical Athens. Now, not too many people have studied Athenian democracy, but it, it happened. And there was also a long effort at Republican government in ancient Rome that helped to inspire our founders. But it had been 1,600 years of imperial and monarchical rule pretty much everywhere since then. And before that and alongside that, it was one tyrant after another. That was how the world was ruled, by the biggest, strongest bully. 
Democratic revolutions in France and the United States in the late 18th century, as well as the gradual democratizing of the British government, helped set the stage for the birth of a modern world in which democracy would become increasingly the standard. People wanted democracy. It spread in the, in the 19th century. It spread into the early 20th century. Uh, it was not uncontested. Um, the communist uh, movement, including the communist revolution in Russia in 1917, uh, was a setback for democracy, even though it was claimed to be a victory of the people. And then in the 20s and 30s, fascism developed and spread, beginning in Italy and then, of course, most famously in Nazi Germany. Communism and fascism were major setbacks for democracy, and a lot of dead bodies were the result of both regimes, types of regimes. The defeat of the Nazis and, the, and their allies during World War II and the discovery of the absolute degeneracy of the fascist governments, which were genocidal and murderous, deeply discredited fascism after the end of World War II. Meanwhile, communism's own bloodbath, both in China and the USSR and in Cambodia, among other places, also discredited communism. So for about a blink of an eye, it looked like all other political systems had been discredited and democracy was on the march. That was like, you know, June 30th, 1989, that was it. Then it was over, right? History doesn't stand still, though. In the 21st century, we have seen signs of democratic backsliding or failure in multiple countries. In the book, I discuss the failure of democracy to consolidate in Russia. Vladimir Putin pretty much choked democracy in its cradle, and he still rules uncontested, so I have a whole chapter on Putin's Russia as well as there has been democratic backsliding in Hungary under Viktor Orban, in Poland under the Law and Justice Party, in Brazil under the, the late not lamented Jair Bolsonaro, and in the US under Donald Trump. I also offer chapters in the book comparing developments in Germany and France from the mid 19th century up to the 1930s in which both of those uh, countries made a fascist turn. Now I'm talking about the Vichy regime in France and the Nazi regime in Germany. I argue that what all these countries, all seven of these countries that I describe, uh, had in common is a peculiar malady that is, you might say, is deeply related to religious and moral traditionalism under pressure. So what do I mean? Uh, this is what I mean by authoritarian reactionary Christianity. It is reactionary in that it is characterized by ferocious negative Christian reaction to cultural changes that are perceived to violate religious and moral traditions. Traditions that were held by once dominant Christian groups. So what we're talking about is social changes happened in societies that had used to be led by like the Russian Orthodox in Russia or the Catholic Church in Poland or the evangelicals and uh, maybe the Catholics in Brazil. Uh, tr traditionalist Christians all and cultural changes develop and a negative reaction comes back strong. I'm talking about in this country, everything that has changed in this country since the 1960s. And a, a consolidation of a negative reaction. Everything that has happened since 1962 is bad. And it's bad in the name of God. That's the kind of movement that's viewed as bad in the name of God. That's the kind of movement that I'm talking about. Close study reveals that in many cases, the reaction, the negative reaction, goes beyond religious and moral concerns like abortion or the family, to matters of race and immigration and ethnicity. Basically, what all the cases I have studied have in common is an allergic reaction to the modern world, an allergic reaction to social changes and legal changes that create greater pluralism in society, uh, an allergic reaction to the loss of a, of a majority Christian group's dominance in society to a sense that the power of previously all-powerful groups to control the direction of culture has, is, is eroding. So basically, these are really nervous, scared, really conservative traditional Christian folks who don't like where things are going, and they, they, they develop a politics of reaction. Does that make sense? Does that sound familiar? We don't have any of that here in this country. That's good, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so that's the reactionary piece, and maybe you know some people who their, their overall reaction to everything modern or new is to be against it. Now, what makes these reactionary movements also authoritarian is two dimensions. On the one hand, they are often authoritarian in their inner life. 
their approach to religious truth or moral rules or church organization is through centralizing power in the hands of one or a few people. Think of the ultra-fundamentalist Baptist church under the iron grip of a pastor. That's basically how I led here when I was pastor. Um, <laughs> um, who knows what is true? Pastor. Who tells us how to interpret the Bible? Pastor. Who gets the final word if there's a dispute? Pastor. Or elder, or bishop, or whoever, right? Patriarch. On the other hand, what makes this inner authoritarianism relevant to people outside of the religious community is that sometimes this authoritarianism, if activated in a political situation, leads people in this religious tradition to withdraw their support from democracy. And this is what I think we are seeing right now. People who are fiercely negative in their reaction to contemporary social changes and things that they fear are coming, um, who are authoritarian in their thinking about religious and moral truth, who are growing frustrated with democracy as a way to get their goals achieved. And because democracy is not delivering what they want, they're tempted to consider other options. Um, they might throw their support behind a Christian strongman like Putin in Russia who says he's protecting Russian Orthodox civilization. Or uh, Orban in Hungary who says he's protecting uh, Hungarian Christians against uh, secularism and liberalism. Uh, or Donald Trump who says, you know, you've never had a stronger backer than me. Just go with me to the Christians. They might throw their support behind a Christian strongman who doesn't really care all that much about the rules because he promises what they want more than democratic rules. They want to have their moral concerns and their religious concerns addressed. I notice in the literature a dynamic that uh, political scientist Michael Walzer has called secular revolution religious counter-revolution. So this is another hook for you to think about. Religious counter-revolution. In a 2015 book, Walzer described how this had happened in Algeria, India, and Israel. That after World War II, these new uh, countries had been born under secular leaders and believed in liberal democratic and secular government and practices that within a generation, all three of those countries had come under the leadership of religious nationalists, um, Muslim, uh, Hindu, and Jewish. So this is not just a Christian thing either. I suggest that for the first time in American history, it is what we are witnessing here. We are witnessing people who believe that, that a woke secular revolution is taking the country away from those who know better what is right and who have a right to rule. And every liberalizing, pluralizing, and democratizing social change that has happened since the 1960s and that is promised is part of this agenda. And so what we need now is a religious counter-revolution. The religious counter-revolution has, has been brewing for a long time. It began, I think, as an effort to take America back through evangelism and missions. Let's tell everybody about Jesus, bold mission thrust. Anybody remember bold mission thrust? A vaguely obscene way to describe missionary efforts, but, you know, whatever, that's what they called it. Um, so I remember when I came into the Christian community, bold mission thrust, the idea was a confidence that we could tell everybody about Jesus and evangelize, re-evangelize our nation. It failed. And then I think the next strategy shortly thereafter was um, a political strategy to bring conservative Christians into a partnership with the Republican Party. And that happened in the 70s, and that movement was called the Christian Right. The main group that you may have heard of at the time was the Moral Majority. Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and so on. <clears throat> and their idea was, if we can marry up to the Republican Party and make sure that in exchange for supporting them unequivocally, we can get what we want, then we can win. And this was help, what helped Ronald Reagan get elected and then most Republican presidents since that time. And since then, there's been a kind of an ironclad commitment of, of this community to the Republican Party. But reading the literature from this community, what I hear is a, is a sense that this also has failed. That despite occasional victories like the overturning of Roe versus Wade, overall, the culture is moving in a direction that the reactionary side doesn't like, and so they're not satisfied with the results. 
And I think this helps to explain, well, if Christian mission fails, and if democratic organizing fails, and you can't win the game any other way, maybe you have to be open to trying more radical means. Maybe you need militias like the, the uh, Proud Boys. Maybe you need Christian enclaves in which other people are not really welcome, like Moscow, Idaho. Maybe you need um, uh, the language of intimidation and threat. Um, maybe you need to go around the Constitution if the Constitution doesn't give you what you want. I think that right now I can see that there is frank exploration by scholars, smart scholars, as well as regular folks, in which you can actually see in print people seriously reconsidering the democratic rules of the game in this country. This is new. This I have not seen before, and I've been doing this for a long time. So many see this problem. I can't tell you how many people I talk to who say, I can't even talk to my family anymore about this stuff. So what do we do about it? I think we need to begin by calling things by their right name. Um, I think the right name is authoritarian reactionary Christianity. There is a language out there that is being more commonly used called Christian nationalism, which I think is helpful, but I think this language is better, and I, I'll be happy to talk with you about that. We also need to clearly see the distinction between reactionary strategies that stay within the boundaries of democracy, like trying to get people elected who will advance your agenda, and those that go beyond the boundaries. So Jerry Falwell was one thing, and the Proud Boys is something different, right? Meanwhile, concerned citizens need to pay attention to the basics of democracy in a way that most of us never bothered to do when it wasn't seemingly threatened like this. We need to know what distinguishes a democratic government from an authoritarian one, and what distinguishes a democratic politician from, a, from an authoritarian. And by the way, for my liberal friends, um, it is not helpful if we like group all Republicans as the same, because they're not the same. Um, there's a, an anti-democratic authoritarian strand often running against a more mainstream person who still stays within the rules of the game, like in primaries, and we need to know the difference. Mitt Romney is not the same thing as Donald Trump, right? Um, Carrie Lake in Arizona was pretty far out compared to some other people who were running. Um, so this is, this is an internal fight within the Republican Party, too, and they've still got to sort it out. But meanwhile, we need to be able to tell the difference. We need to go back to school on our own best traditions. For over 400 years, congregationalist, Baptist-type democracy has taught ordinary people how to govern themselves. How many business meetings have we seen in this space? <laughs> and they are so fun, you know, just so fun. But you know what it says? I, I, I write this in the church, you know, in the book. A Baptist church, a congregationalist church with congregational autonomy is a group of people having covenanted together to try to pursue the lordship of Christ um, they write out rules called bylaws. They have a constitution. They have votes. Um, the pastor is not a king. If the pastor thinks he or she is a king, the pastor is gone before too long. The, the, the polity belongs to the community. Does that sound familiar? This practice of congregational democracy is a resource for democracy itself. People who learn how to serve on committees and make policy decisions and have intelligent votes and tolerate difference and have civil discussions. These are the kinds of people we need in society when we've forgotten how to do that. So I am calling in the book for us to remember the, the, the congregational democratic baptistic tradition that not only taught ordinary people, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, how to be a Democrat, little d, it also um, advocated for major reforms in government like limits on state power and, um, and civil and human rights and a voice for the people, all that crazy kind of stuff that made up democracy. From the 17th century, Baptists were arguing against Christianity as an imperial or domineering project of a majority. And covenantal theologies at their best, which emerged from a strand of Puritan and Baptist tradition, taught us to think of, of community not as a family dynasty like, you know, Anne Smith and her family ruled the church here like generation after generation, not like that. But instead, as a covenant of the people together, made by equals to advance the common project. We're in a covenant together. We do it together. 
we should think of, of uh, political life like that as well. It's a shared covenant. And um, everybody gets a voice, and nobody gets more than one voice. Um, the dissenting, the, another chapter in the book is I talk about the black democratic tradition in the US. From the very founding of our country and before, um, black Democrats, little d Democrats, argued that there were desperate flaws built into the US version of democracy because we accepted slavery in the beginning. And that for America to be what America's own documents and ideals promised, we would have to undo white supremacism, not just get rid of slavery, but get rid of the mentality of white supremacism and racism built into the structures of society. Um, it is interesting that the language of what we need is a new democratic covenant, Martin Luther King struck those notes. I hear our, our, our current Senator Raphael Warnock using the language of a new democratic covenant today. A new democratic covenant in which all are included on equal terms. So last paragraph, I think. Today, Christians need to remember some things. This is not just about our politics, it's also about our discipleship. I think that authoritarian reactionary Christianity is just bad Christianity. We need to remember that Christ is Lord. If we are Christians, we believe this, and that the way of Christ does not get suspended in, in what some may perceive to be an emergency. I'm running into a lot of Christians who are like, you know, things are so bad with these woke liberals trying to take over everything. I know Jesus says we're supposed to love our neighbors and stuff, but that doesn't apply here. There's too much at stake. This is cosmic. A battle of good and evil. I have a lot of quotes in the book about people saying that kind of stuff. We need to recall the pro-democratic resources that can be mined from scripture. This is an interesting issue. Scripture, because the Bible does not depict any functioning democracies, some people read the Bible as a authorization for authoritarianism, but, uh, but I talk in the book about resources in the Bible that are pro-democratic, including some of the things we see in the early church, as well as some of the things we see in the Hebrew Bible and the legal and covenantal material. Um, we can reject authoritarianism because we know that God is against tyranny. The God who, who, who liberated the Jewish slaves from bondage, um, the God who raised up uh, Jesus, who... The God uh, who stood with John the Baptist who was murdered by a tyrant, that's, that's a tradition that we can connect with. Um, it shouldn't surprise any Christian the idea that too much centralized power is bad for people because we have an idea about this. It's called the doctrine of human sin. One reason why Christians supported democracy was because it diffused power rather than having it be concentrated in one hand. We can remember how bad it was when religious majorities were able to impose their beliefs in violation of the consciences and maybe the bodies of dissenters. I was talking to somebody who said, remember what it was like in England when they were going back and forth between Catholic and Protestant? When the Protestants were in charge, were killing the Catholics. When the Catholics are in charge, were killing the Protestants. Who's up? Who's down? Who's being burned at the stake? We left that behind for a reason. And yet there are people today who are wanting to write Jesus into the Constitution and, and uh, kind of basically give up this whole separation of church and state thing. Reconsidering a 240-year-old tradition enshrined in the First Amendment. We can learn to live in societies with profound diversity of beliefs. We don't have to ever believe the same thing we do. We might actually even learn from somebody who believes something different. We can remember God's concern expressed in the Bible for those on the margins. And notice that in authoritarian reactionary Christianity in every country, Part of how leaders gain and hold power is by attacking marginalized groups. It's just part of the strategy. Whether that's people of a different color or Jews or women or immigrants or LGBTQ people, whatever, whoever the target is, that's how you accrue power. I will protect you against those other people in the name of God. We need a better religion than that. We can resolutely resist a politics of cruelty and domination where the cruelty seems to be the point. We can renew our commitment to the rights of our fellow citizens as a recognition of how much God loves and values all people without exception. We can recommit to personal virtue and good democratic participation. We can stand against deteriorations of Christian identity in which Christianity gets confused and conflated with nationalism, racism, and xenophobia and homophobia. 
We can love our neighbors by doing justice in political life. Um, Today, I think we are called to resist authoritarian, reactionary Christian politics, but we have to propose something better. I believe that um, we already have within our tradition the resources to do better. So this is a book that, that tells this story that, and that proposes resources for doing better. I think it's always better to have some resources to move ahead with than just to throw up our hands and say, what has gotten into all those people? That's not a strategy. That's a recipe for despair. So that is my argument in the book. Um, it's the most politically oriented book I've ever written, most historical, perhaps, but it is also still what I've always been called to do. It's about Christians following Jesus faithfully in the current moment, and I hope it proves helpful to everybody who decides that they'd like to read it. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Dr. Goshi. Am I on? Can you hear this? No. No. Okay, I'm going to use the preacher voice. <laughs> We're going to spend a few more minutes in dialogue about this. And what I'm, I'm hoping is to invite you forward to, uh, we encourage you to come first to the, the mic in the middle so that we can make sure that we're recording your question and that your question is heard by everyone that is in the audience. So, um, but I do have a roving mic. If you are unable to come to the mic, raise your hand, and I'll be happy to bring this one to you as a second option. We encourage you to come forward and ask your question of Dr. Gushy, and please make it a question. Think about the entire thing before you do approach it, and um, um, and let's engage with with Dr. Gushy. The floor is open. I call on Mickey Goodson. In, in which case, I'll call on you to uh, provide an answer for me. <laughs> um, I grew up in this uh, uh, post-World War II generation in which it was a little small town. Uh, there was a civil religion. I learned it in grade school. I learned it at my little small rural church, and it was about democracy and the common good. Um, where have we screwed up in the church? Uh, you know, we can talk about all the rest of the world, but where has... That church, where has this church screwed up that uh, we haven't uh, continued to tell that message? I mean, I, I have been an ordained Baptist pastor for um, 36 years. Is that possible? No. No, it is possible. Yes, it is true. I am that old. I was ordained at three. They saw real <laughs> gifts. Um, real gifts. That's right, that's right. Um, I don't think uh, in any church that I've been in, including when I was leading them, we ever made an intentional effort to talk about democracy. I do think that in Baptist churches, sometimes we talked about our own democratic processes. Here's how we do it. If you want to make an amendment, you got to do this, and, and, and here's how we do voting. And, and implicitly, we were teaching democracy um, uh, that way, but... But I also think democracy was more taken for granted. Like when, when people ran for president, if they lost, they acknowledged that they had lost. And they went to the next inauguration and they gritted their teeth and they shook hands with the next person and they moved on, right? Um, and people didn't say that the elections were rigged and people didn't say, uh, didn't support militia movements that were armed. And um, in other words, we just, we've had some unprecedented developments that have made us have to, um, to think again about being more intentional. Like, this, like the one paragraph that I gave you about what is democracy, I mean, it took me a while to come up with that. It's just not intuitive anymore. To, I mean, unless you are in the politics business, I think, to even have that language at hand. The other thing I would say to your question, Mickey, is that some of that small town civil religion that we got back in the day also assumed a certain kind of culture. Um, white, um, small town, Christian dominated, you wouldn't be surprised to have the mayor make sure you had a prayer at the city prayer, at the city uh, hall meeting, and it would be a Christian prayer in Jesus' name. And the kids would maybe say the Lord's Prayer over in the local school that was public, and the, you know, the coach might lead a prayer at the 50-yard line for the football game, and it was, 
segregated for the most part, officially or unofficially. Um, and democracy, in a sense, worked because it was the democracy of like our folks. Um, but then when America uh, became much more radically plural with, you know, 1965, an immigration act that opened uh, uh, immigration from a lot of non-European oriented or origin people. And the civil rights movement um, uh, demanded equal rights and, and uh, integration gradually happened after uh, Brown. Um, and, uh, you know, um, growing a Hispanic population and a growing religious diversity and moral opinion diversity and some people with blue hair and some people with green hair and some people with more and more atheists and agnostics and more and more people who came from other world religions and people who spoke different languages. And in other words, I think a lot of folks have been disoriented by the amount of change in the culture and also maybe have lost control of the democracy that they used to be in charge of. I think that the election of Barack Obama is a significant part of this story. I think that for a certain part of the American population, the idea that somebody of his background and skin color could be elected president twice was a radical shock and helped to contribute to the um, conspiracy theories about him and then the backlash that happened after that. Um, how could we live in a country where this person could be our president? That was the idea. I think that's part of the story, an accelerant. But even without that election, um, the, the dramatic cultural changes that are visible any day, you walk around in Decatur or uh, in Atlanta, there's a certain temperament that finds all of this change and diversity and uh, all these different languages and religions and stuff really destabilizing and believes that has kind of coalesced around the idea that, well, okay, maybe we're not gonna kick them all out, though you do have people talking about kicking out like all the immigrants, or at least the illegal immigrants, undocumented, um, and banning legal immigration. That's nativism and xenophobia. Um, but, but they wanna make America great again which means make America more like that town that you grew up in and less like the world that we live in now. And you can layer the word Christian on top of that and it, it is not without meaning because probably most everybody was some kind of Christian or, except for an occasional outlier. But all of it gets layered together in what I call a politics of nostalgia and despair. In fact, one of the books that I cite in my chapter on Germany, it's called The Politics of Cultural Despair. I think a lot of the spirit of our politics right now is, is best understood as a despairing reaction. And despair is jet fuel for extremism in politics. Who's next? Mickey Goodson. No, let's, let's have somebody else. Okay. Okay. I call on Scott Pyron. How many of your authors could come in here and name the names of all the people coming, right? I mean, think about that. Okay, all right. I think I'm think He is. It's yeah. I sometimes think that our difficulty of talking to people at all particularly about any difficult or challenging topic is part of our problems in, in churches and in organized religion, in politics, in families. Yeah. This is the thing that I hear a lot. Well, I can't talk to my brother and sister and about anything that I would consider serious. But that overlaps in a way with me, with my the response that you'll get if you suggest something in church, oh, that's politics. You, you can't talk politics. And if you lump that so that everything you don't like is politics, which is possible, mm -hmm. then you don't dare talk about anything. Yeah. And I know that didn't have a question, but you get my point. I do, yeah. Um, I, I'll, let me... Uh, 
say that everybody I talk to about this book, every podcaster, every individual, they talk about the stresses in family life. Let me ask you, raise your hand. How many would you say that you have a family member who you dare not talk with them about politics if you don't want to have a fight? <laughs> I'll call that a strong majority. I've got two hands over here. If you had four hands, you'd be raving them, right? Yeah. Um, I have students who dread Thanksgiving. Okay, like, do I go home with a friend? Do I stay in my dorm? Or do I go home and deal with Aunt Irma? Who's going to tell me everything she picked up on whatever news site? Um, I was reading in some of this democratic theory a a sharply polarized society that kind of goes like this with two poles and not, not like four options, but two options, especially relatively evenly divided, and maybe some people in the middle who just wish they could stay out of it, but, but they feel torn and moved to the poles as well. That's a, um, that's a recipe for something the founders warned about, which is factionalism. It's in the Federalist Papers. Factionalism is essentially, and actually George Washington was really concerned about the development of political parties that would be permanent because he didn't want the country to descend into factionalism. Instead, we should think for ourselves and, and, and put forward people that's not about parties, but who is the best person for the job. Remember that? Instead, um, <laughs> we have like these two dysfunctional, diametrically opposed parties in a lot of ways and a lot of people in the middle not feeling totally represented. But the thing, a good definition of factionalism when it really settles in is when the parties are so divided, the, the sides are so divided that you hate each other more than you love anything in common. And that actually happened in Vichy, France, in the period, or the, in France, just before the Nazis invaded. You had a left and right that hated each other so much that, that they they weakened the country. They were not ready for the Nazi assault, in part because half the country was kind of hoping it would happen because their agenda um, would be possibly better advanced and the other side would lose. And I fear that we are tearing each other apart so much with that kind of factionalism. Now to that question about church. Um, people say, well, being a pastor has become very, very difficult in this country for a lot of reasons, and one of them is politics. Um, I was interim pastor here during the early Trump years, and um, knowing when to speak and when not to speak and when to say the man's name and when not to say the man's name and being able to survive differences of opinion about that kind of thing has been hard for lots of pastors. In the more conservative churches, there's been pressure uh, to essentially endorse Trump and everything Trump does or you lose your job. People have left the ministry over that. I know several of them. And, and pressure is on the other side in another way. It is true that, like, if you say, well, if we talk about immigration, that's politics. If we talk about race, that's politics. If we talk about uh, patriarchy, that's politics. If we talk about sexuality, that's politics. Then you can't talk about much of anything. Like, you can, I mean, you can't talk about things that people think about in everyday life. You can talk about only spiritual matters. Um, but from a Christian ethics perspective, these are all ethical issues. They've become political issues, but they're part of discipleship. We have to be able to think about them. So uh, I have a student. I'm supervising PhD students now, by the way, and it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, it is. They're cool. It's a lot of work. I mean, they write lots of words, lots of words. Um, but I have a student who's working on what he calls um, the apolitical escape hatch um, that many Christian churches have taken we don't want to be left, we don't want to be right, we're just going to stay out of politics. And the critique of that is it involves abdicating a voice when sometimes a voice must be uh, offered. Who's next? Oh, okay. And then, uh, You're actually up first. Yeah, come on, yeah, we're good. What do you think Citizens United has to do with this where we can only elect people who have lots of money or who are beholden to uh, special interest groups? Um, money money um, dominates our politics and um, 
I mean, we spend so many billions and billions and billions of dollars on elections at every level, it can't help but be corrupting. Now, when that decision was, was rendered by the Supreme Court, it was, I think, a, a very unfortunate decision, but, but something relatively new has developed. Um, it isn't just the big corporate donors that distort our politics because they can essentially, I mean, they can make a huge difference in somebody's war chest because they just drop it in 250,000 or a million or two million or five million or 10 million and with various ways to avoid uh, transparency and accountability. But the other thing that has developed more recently is the small dollar donation based on hot, passionate political loyalty. And that's a lot of, uh, of who fuels the most popular uh, candidates right now. So it isn't just the corporate money, it's also that people are so fired up about politics that they'll dip again and again and again into their personal pocket for the small gift. And so if 20 million people give $25, you got some real money. So there's a lot of passion in our politics, there's a lot of money in it, and some grifters have figured out how to get into people's pockets by striking the notes that they want and getting some money out of them. Um, I think our elections should be much shorter. I think there should be limits on campaign spending. Um, I think there, we should go back to much tighter financial controls. I mean, do we really need 15 months to figure out who the two candidates are gonna be for president and then to do all those primaries and all those ads and, um, so money is a distorting factor in our politics, and it does favor those who have a lot of money, but I did want to make a footnote about, about the power of the passionate small donor as well. If you can activate them, you can make a lot of money. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it seems to me there's been from progressives on the left side, there's been a, a <coughs> it seems to me that the left side also, progressive side, also has some uh, are enemies of democracy in some cases. I mean, I just was sitting here jotting down a few yeah. of the ideas. I mean, I think Joe Biden's executive order to forgive student loan debt was not a democratic decision, for mm. example. <coughs> the government has co tried to coerce social media companies to suppress free speech. There have been COVID lockdowns against the will of the people in some states. Mm -hmm. Sanctuary cities that ignore laws. Most of those are left-leaning. Shouting down speakers at college. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a professor, you know that. Yeah. <coughs> Making faculty members sign DEI vows. Government trying to coerce birth business people to betray their deeply held convictions. I saw that in the... Supreme Court case that was just decided in favor of the business. Right. <coughs> Protests outside the homes of Supreme Court justices to try to intimidate them. Mm -hmm. Vandalism of these pregnancy uh, resource centers. Uh, yeah. School, school districts. School districts that are behind parents' back, allowing children to transition without telling them about it. There's a lot of different things mm -hmm. that seem anti-democratic to me on the left, the progressive side, and how do you address that? Okay, I so do. The other question, the yeah. second question would yeah. be, <coughs> the Supreme Court in their Dobbs decision overturned Roe v. Wade, as you're well aware. Yeah. And that seems to me like it was returning democracy to the people at the state level. Mm. And so how do, would you address that? Again? Yeah. Um, great questions. One thing I, I try to do in the book is to take seriously the kinds of concerns that you also just articulated. Um, um, so, for example, even the paradigm of secular revolution, religious counter-revolution, um, assumes that, that certain um, developments in culture, sometimes enforced by uh, you know powerful university or K through 12 or governmental or other kinds of actors, um, uh, are experienced as illiberal and coercive, and um, 
and that is a real concern on the right. In fact, the way, the, the way that the right describes what I'm describing is essentially we've been under the tyranny of the left since the 60s. And the tyranny of the left has been uh, administered through um, uh, the media and the uh, higher education and K through 12 like apparatus, and um, and often uh, through uh, de uh, Democratic Party leaders and and uh, through kind of um, uh, the administrative apparatus of the state. And and so we are pushing back. I do think that the flirtation with um, um, kind of working around, uh, I mean, with militia violence and with working around uh, accepting the results of an election, I'm seeing it more on the right than on the left in various countries. But most of the examples you mentioned are examples that I also think are problematic. Um, the, for example, the use of, ex the overuse of executive orders by presidents is partly a result of not being able to get Congress to pass laws. When you feel like um, the, the legislative apparatus is essentially broken, and I think in our country partisanship is helping it to be broken, plus the rules of the Senate with that 60 vote majority for everything, super majority, um, then sometimes people are tempted to go around uh, with executive orders that are sometimes struck down by the Supreme Court. So I'm concerned about the use of, uh, overuse of executive orders as well. Um, the schools are a major battleground. I mean, the right accuses the left of, of pushing its agenda. Now the left is accusing the right. In general, what, here's what I, what I hear. The, the, uh, the idea that we can navigate our differences and, and find a way to respect the core conscientious boundaries of both sides is eroding, and it seems to be winner take all. If it's four to three liberal, then the liberals just do everything they want. If it's four to three conservative, then the conservatives just do everything they want. And, and this is a recipe for instability and for um, even uh, the undermining of democracy because, I mean, one vote and, and people go to maximal extremes when they have the one vote. We have to do better than that. Um, so, yes, I, I want to acknowledge um, problems on, uh, on the left as well. And in the book, I, t I give some examples of that and say, these concerns need to be taken seriously. Um, and they are fueling the, the reactionary authoritarian uh, move on the other side. So, you know, if you look at the bestseller list, like in my area right now, every other book is written from the left or from the right. You know, so, you know, woke America destroying our families next to this book, next to, you know, Take America Back for God next to fight off those radical Republicans. It's just, it, everything is bifurcated. Uh, it's really scary, the level of polarization. Thank you for your question. Are we out of time? Maybe one, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That the media plays in this issue and it's hard to find a reasonable voice to educate myself. I just, we come down between Fox and CNN and neither one of them has any solution. It's just how much can we throw out there to sell ad time? Um, and to get clicks on social media, yeah. um, which the algorithms are geared to uh, controversy and outrage. The more outrage, uh, the more um, clicks, the more revenue, right? So most scholars working on this issue say that the media environment's changes are a significant part of what we're dealing with. Um, this is not the days that some of us grew up in. Remember CBS, NBC, and ABC? Remember that? And uh, they tried to hew pretty middle of the road because they had like the whole audience, you know? And now with the segment segmentation of the market, um, it's really difficult. I, I think on the national side, the polarity is really Fox and people to the right of Fox and MSNBC, not so much CNN. CNN under, well, the guy who just got fired was trying to be more middle of the road. We don't know what they're gonna do now. But we, the people, bear responsibility too if what we want is it being inflamed. There are more, um, more balanced news sources. I like looking at the Economist and BBC and NPR and 
a number of sources that come from outside the U.S. And, you know, read the Wall Street Journal editorial page as well as the New York Times editorial page. At least get different perspectives. Um, and watch out for what is reported as news. Just because you see it online doesn't mean that it's news, right? Yeah. Maybe you have time for one more one question more? Okay. and then closing mm -hmm. remarks. Then we'll go sign books. I want to see a lot of you at my table. I order this because I am now an authoritarian leader. Okay. Yes. Okay, two is fine. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hi. Bob Morris. Hey. Me, but thank you for coming out sure. tonight. I bought your book on Kindle today. I'll, I'll sign your Kindle, sir. Yes, okay. I will. Okay. okay. My question has to do, if you look at this past weekend, we almost brought this nation to a financial collapse. Now, that's not good for the left or the right. Not good for anybody. How do we bring this country back to its common sense? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, vote gushy for president. Um, <laughs> no, well, I think, I think it's, it's um, partly uh, we are electing um, bomb throwers uh, and, and that has to do partly with gerrymandered districts in which uh, the only challenge you're ever going to get if you get elected is from your radical extreme, either to the left or to the right. So if you can get in a safe Democratic district, you're safe for life unless you are seen as not liberal enough. And same thing on the Republican side if you're not conservative enough. So some people have gotten elected. Um, they're never going to face a, a meaningful opposite party challenger. And this is a recipe for um, uh, incendiary politics and trying to, I mean, the way you get attention is by being more radical than you were the day before, right? Um, and, and there is a certain nihilism in our politics right now, burn it all down. Um, burn it all down is a really dangerous philosophy to be in the hands of the people who have their hands on power. You don't really want that. Um, but that also is a politics of despair hey, why don't we just burn it all down and see what happens? Um, I kind of think something has been built up here over a lot of years that is worth reforming rather than burning down. Um, the fact that we can't um, do any kind of normal budget process and that every time it's time to reauthorize the government, we have this kind of budget shutdown dance is ridiculous. It's hurting our credit rating as a country. Um, it's it's uh, making everybody crazy. Um, it's, it's a sign of our dysfunctionality. Who else had a hand up? There was one more that you, yeah, Milton, yeah, last question, yeah. David, based on your introduction, you supply, indicated there's a commonality in the descent from democracy not into autocracy. Right. That suggests a shared or predictable trajectory. Where do you think we are on that trajectory? At what point can we not pull it up? Did y'all hear that question? Um, is there a identifiable trajectory from democracy to authoritarianism or the loss of democracy, and where are we? Um, I think that 2022 was kind of encouraging for me because in a number of states, pretty radical candidates ran and were defeated. Um, and it leads me to think that the appetite for radical rearrangement of our political, of our government system is not, certainly not a majority. Um, and maybe it's no more than 15 or 20 percent. I do notice that in a lot of European countries, radical right parties are growing in, in uh, appeal. Uh, like in Germany, where they're always very nervous about that kind of thing, the AFD party is, is sitting at around 20 percent right now. 20% is dangerously high. Um, I think that there are a lot of interested, um, <clears throat> a lot of interested um, citizens and <clears throat> um, political philosophers and people who pay attention to these things um, who are trying to mobilize to strengthen democracy. So I don't think it's like 1932 in Germany or something. Um, I don't think that um, that we are, you know, anywhere near where Hungary is, say. But I do think the election of an openly authoritarian 
anti-democratic president uh, and the consolidation of power by such a person would be a different situation. Um, so we have a longer standing democratic culture with, with some pretty ingenious checks and balances and civil society watchdog groups that are well mobilized and an increasingly alarmed citizenry in large measure paying attention more than before. So I'm actually somewhat hopeful right now, but not complacent. Um, I think that what happens in the next 18 months uh, will, it's, it's, it's up to us. And so I would call all of us to, to the best democratic citizen participation, mobilizing if you're a person of faith, mobilizing the resources of faith uh, for that. And I think it's time for pastors in churches to go ahead and do some seminars on the basics of democracy and maybe to call people to humble local forms of democracy like uh, serving in the polling stations and, uh, and a number of other ways. Um, uh, was it Benjamin Franklin who said, here's your democracy or it's, a, it's your democracy, if you can keep it, I do think it is at risk. And maybe we'll stop there. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Gushy. Everyone is welcome to come to the table to get your book signed. Acapella is still selling them in the back.